perfect. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> Girls trip. <laughs> I should start writing notes right after I read it. The Chosen by the Moon. Hi, we're the Reading Queens, and we're here to blab about our favorite books, why we love them, and the book boyfriends we wish were real. And we're back for another episode. Uh, welcome, and we are very excited to be here and talk about a specific trope. So I'm Valia, by the way. Hi. I'm Joanna. I'm Tess. And I'm Clary. Yeah, and we're excited. We're excited to be here. We kind of had a pre-recording conversation, which just got me more pumped about this conversation because this is a different trope for us. And I think it's the most, like, I wouldn't say controversial, but one that we don't write, for sure. But also one we don't really read either. One we don't so. really understand. <laughs> <either>. Yes. <laughs> so this is going to be a lot of, like, raw emotions about these books and this idea. But yeah, I'm excited. But first, how is everybody doing? Wonderful. <laughs> Great. <laughs> oh, perfect. That's what I'm I like out to of hear. quarantine. Yay! <laughs> Yay! Yay! <laughs> we had a we had a unicorn party this last week. Ooh. So that was fantastic. Night. Wait, did you get a real horse <laughs> no. and put a wh- horn oh, on them? Oh. Cool. No, my my cute mother in law. We did. So there's not very many um, grandchildren who are girls. Most of them are boys. And so for the five-year-old's birthday party, I decided to have just a girl party. And Aww. it was everything unicorn. Like, And this is by my daughter's request that there was unicorn cupcakes. Aww. And my niece made unicorn popcorn. What? And there was unicorn like dip for the fruits. <laughs> and Cute. it was, it was, oh, and we had unicorn plates. And yeah, it was a lot of fun. Aww. That sounds yeah. adorable. Well, I've been watching a lot of musicals lately. That's my news for the week. <laughs> We've been, me and my daughter have been watching um, High School Musical, the musical, the series, uh, season we two. Watched that too. Yes, I loved season one. <laughs> I, love it. I will say that I'm not like super sucked into season two, just because like I don't know. I feel like um, it just doesn't quite have the same um, like magic that I felt like the first one had. But I'm I'm excited to keep watching. I love having a show that I'm interested in that like my daughter also watches. Um, but she yeah. wanted to watch more musicals, and then I was like, oh, let's watch. I I had to look it up to see how like child appropriate in the Heights was. Um, and so I was like, okay, it looks <laughs> like it's you know it's you know su- some suggestive dialogue. And then I we watched a trailer for it, and she just she loves song and dance, and so I was like, okay, we'll try it. And it was so good. I loved watching with her. It was super long, too. We, like, actually had to, like, take a a short break, like, in the middle of it just because it's, like, (laughs) such a long musical. But that was so good. And the music was really good. And, like, okay, so the funny thing about, like, because I also watched Hamilton afterward. But, like, the thing that got me interested in this is not long ago, um, at least a few months ago, I watched – his dark materials on HBO, Mm -hmm. the series. And like, Mm -hmm. um, the character Lee Scoresby like ended up being one of my favorites just because his character was like so wholesome. He's like, Oh, you know, I'm, I'm this like toughened, like, (laughs) um, like he just reminded me of like a, a guy from like an, an old western or whatever. But he's like, but I'm gonna protect these kids. Like I just met this little girl, but she's a chosen one. I'm gonna protect her. And he was like such a, a wholesome <laughs> character. And everyone in that movie has like really good acting. But for some reason, he just like he was just one of my favorites. Yeah. And then I like recognized his 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 actor name because it's kind of hard to forget. Which was um uh what is it Lin Lin Manuel Miranda. Yeah, and so I'm like, and then I saw his name on like the um on in the Heights. I'm like, wait, what? Lee Scoresby like is also like a music guy. <laughs> and then so I realized that he like had like written, directed, like wrote the music. And I'm like, wait, what? And he's not just like this yep. actor in this like one show that nope. I've seen. And they're like, apparently he's way bigger than I thought. Um, and then I was like, okay, well now I have to watch Hamilton, which I didn't watch that one with my daughter because mm-hmm. I did see that that one was a little bit more mature. Um, in content, mm-hmm. uh, but I watched that one by myself and I loved it. So I've been like, I love I'm like one. immersed in musicals this week, and it's been really fun. I'm like, <laughs> they're all they're so unique too. I'm like, I don't get those same feels from um, some of the other musicals I've seen. I'm like, I just want more of his musicals. Like they're really good. They're super creative and fun. Yeah, he he wrote the music for Moana. 
Ugh, Moana. That makes so much sense. What? He's yeah. so prolific. He is. That is so funny. Well, he started, yeah, he started on Broadway. So, like, In the Heights was his okay. first uh, Broadway. And then Hamilton came after that. But, like, Hamilton is the one that became, like, the this huge thing that's, like, swept the world or whatever. Um, and it was really funny because I was in New York when that came out. And so I was, like, there for all of it. And it, like has such a special place in my heart and then after Hamilton you know I went back and like listened to In the Heights and I lived in Washington Heights so it was like this like super meta moment where I'm like listening to In the Heights (laughs) I'm like walking down the street in my neighborhood and it was just like yeah it was like a whole thing and when the In the Heights came out we have HBO so I made like my parents watch it with me and then take my mom to this to like the movie theaters to see it too because it's like we're just gonna have a like a great time with this and so she's like are you gonna cry every single time you watch it I'm like yes yes I will it's so good (laughs) yeah it's fun and I do I do love his uh, music he's writing some of the music for the Little Mermaid live action oh wow that's awesome yeah with the with alan what is his name minkin. the original composer minkin. yeah minkin yeah they're working together on some stuff for the live action so i'm that's like really awesome. excited about that yeah now that i know like how much stuff he's done i'm like before i had no idea who this person was until his like <laughs> his role as lee scoresby who's like that's probably like his least significant thing he's done but now i'm like this guy is super talented like i want to if he's doing something i will check it out like i will i will see what what kind of things he's involved in <laughs> did you watch the new mary poppins no he's in that <laughs> oh really does, does he yeah. act or is he yeah he's the uh the one of the uh what's it called the the not the chimney sweeps sweeps but the um he's like a pretty big part of the movie. okay well i haven't seen like, there's two of them now aren't there of the new of the like remakes or whatever or is it just one I think it's just okay. one of Mary Poppins Returns That's what it's called? with uh, Emily Blunt. Oh, okay. See, I thought yeah. that was a sequel because it had the word returns on it. So I'm like, I can't watch that until we watch the first one. Okay, well, now I guess I'll add that to the list the, of what the, to watch. The first one longer. is the original Mary Poppins that came out okay. <laughs> whenever yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well then, I'll watch the I'll I'll watch the new one with my daughter. She'll probably be she'll have a kick out of that. Yeah, yeah, she'll like that, and they do some really fun stuff. I watched that special that they did um, back in June with the like the um, honoring some of the um, actors, and they had like the din- uh, with the dude that did. Oh my gosh, now I'm like spacing on the name. <laughs> Is it Dick Van Van Dyke or something? Uh-huh. Okay, yeah, yeah, he was there. Yeah, he yeah. And so, um, like, Derek Hough did, like, a dance and stuff. Like, they, they had, like, a whole production for it. And I'm just like, can I just watch this on repeat? Because, like, I love stuff like that. Like, I love, like, the – I'm a Broadway person, okay? And no, I've never been in the show. I've never acted, which I think, like, Kristen asked me that one time. She was like, <laughs> were you in it because you love it so much? I'm like, no, I would, like, never be on stage in front of people to do stuff like that. But I just love it so much. And I think it came from, like, my mom just instilling that love of music into me and the experience of it is amazing but anyway so I like watch just like these performances of like the from Dancing with the Stars when they do like stuff mm-hmm. like that or whatever and I'm like oh I love it that's why I like like the new Disney musicals you know like the dis- mm-hmm. uh, Disenchantments I watched that I made my parents watch that with me because I was like we're gonna watch this there's gonna be music and they're gonna do choreographed dancing it's gonna be <laughs> great <laughs> I <love it. laughs> and uh, my dad's not a big like dancing person like he's like he'll watch Dancing with the Stars with us uh, because he just like wants to spend time with us but he's like wouldn't choose it but I did make him watch in the heights with us and he was like that was actually good I was like I told you (laughs) I need to watch that yeah when I when I was a kid the way my parents would I'm the oldest of four and the way my parents would pay me for babysitting my younger siblings is they would take me to like big Broadway productions when they would come oh, into Salt so Lake. Cool. And so like I saw Cats and I saw uh, Phantom of the Opera and like my first introduction to Romeo and Juliet was a production like that. So I also love Oh my gosh, that's calls. amazing. <laughs> I remember once when we were little going up into London for the day and um my dad spent the whole day, I mean, we went to various museums or stuff in the morning. My dad spent the whole day winding my sister up that we were going to go to Lords and watch the cricket because England were playing a test match. 
And my sister got so grumpy and so upset that they didn't want to do anything and it just sort of sat down and, and refused to move that they actually had to sit us down and say, look, he's joking. We're not actually doing that. We're actually going to see Joseph and Technicolor Dreamcoat um, <laughs> in the West End. <laughs> um, I can't remember if it was still with um, Jason Donovan or if it was when Philip Schofield had taken over, but it was certainly with one of those two with the the, the high profile guy okay. and their, their plan was just to walk past to go oh should we go in here what well, this looks like fun <laughs> just oh. not to, not to talk. <laughs> but yeah my dad oh spent my yeah my dad spent the whole time winding us up that we were going to go to the cricket and and just getting everybody more stressed <laughs> and more upset at things that, that they had to tell us <laughs> That's such a dad thing to yeah, do. Yeah, that oh, is. Oh, my gosh. I need to do that with my kids. My parents did this once, and it was awesome. Oh, I love that. That's really funny. I was thinking back to, like, what uh, musicals that I've seen or, like, what introduced me, because obviously I didn't start out seeing Broadway shows in New York, you know, because that's, like, a trip. I do now though. Like it was funny last year when, um, before COVID happened in February, I was like on this war path. I was like, I am going to New York to see Moulin Rouge on Broadway. I have to say, Ooh. see Aaron Trevitt as like, as Christian, like I have to, like it was the whole thing and it ended up happening. And then COVID hit like right as I got home. So it was like the perfect timing for everything. It was amazing. Nice. And also Moulin Rouge on Broadway is like the best thing ever. But anyway, <laughs> um, one of the first Broadway shows that I saw in America was Wicked. When I was back in college, uh, we like drove over, sneak over to California. Uh, don't tell my college. Uh, me and my <laughs> best friend. And we like went and spent a day, you know, in Hollywood. And then we went and saw the show. It was like the best experience. But one of the shows that really sticks out in my head that I've seen here in Arizona is Beauty and the Beast. And the whole thing, the only thing I remember from the show is just how absolutely raunchy it is. I was like, <laughs> really? What is like there's Beauty and the Beast? Yes. So like the candlestick was like the most raunchy comedian <laughs> ever. And I'm sitting there and like surrounded by these children and I'm like, this is so awkward <laughs> like <laughs> what is these jokes I don't understand and that's like the only thing that sticks in my mind from that show is oh how like gosh. inappropriate <laughs> it was <laughs> But yeah, anyway, I can talk about Broadway for like hours and oh, hours. Can, yeah. <laughs> we can apparently do an entire episode. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, maybe mini episode. Yeah. We yes. can do one of those. That would be fun. That would be fun. There was just like us gush about our favorite shows. Who would want to listen to that? <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is, is that I've never seen one as an adult. The only musicals I've ever seen in person were when I was a child because my mom did stage acting acting um when I was little so I was like I have so many memories of just hanging out backstage while my mom was like doing like rehearsals and stuff and then I would Aww. sit in the crowd and like watch because my mom um she was a single mom for like the first like five years of my life um so it was just me and her and she was doing a lot of stage acting so those are like I honestly can't think of any like show that I've actually seen since I was a child so it's really fun because I love musicals but I've that's just never been something that I've like gone out to do um I just see them on tv Girls apparently trip. I know I was yes. just thinking Girls that trip. yeah <laughs> so I need to see one as an adult because like I have such this nostalgia and this like warm snuggly feeling of like the back end of being in shows and like watching them yeah. be like, that's my mom. She's the, she's the monkey in the Wizard of Oz. She jumps on that guy's <laughs> back right there. <laughs> then I'm like, I need to, I need to like, and I need to bring my daughter to them. So yes. she can like start yes. building warm fuzzies about like musicals and stage performances. Yeah. It's such an experience. Like I don't think people who have never been and are very turned off by it because like, Oh, it's a musical. I'm like, no, it's, it's so much more than that. Like seeing these people do this live. Like oh, I took talent. my mom to write. Mm -hmm. I took my mom to see um, the bodyguard and you know, it's based on the movie with Whitney Houston and my mom loves Whitney Houston. So she's just a very big fan of the music in general. And we're sitting there in this adaptation of like the movie, right? And I've seen the movie like a million times. And I was still in like this shock over everything that happened because 
the the late the girl that did the woman that did the like the the played the part the Whitney Houston part her voice like just thinking about it gives me goosebumps some of the stuff she did we're just sitting there like in awe the whole time and it's just and she's doing it live like right there yeah it's there's like, no editing on that there's no, no like <laughs> and they have to there's do it so night after that, night like, after live. night it's like, yeah, yeah it's, it's amazing yeah. how what oh my gosh I'm so impressed like when I was watching Hamilton because that was like a recorded version of like this or live stage performance and I was like yes. these people don't get to do multiple takes they have to get yeah. all of this choreography and the music and the lyrics and there's rapping they have to get this all perfect and I'm just like overwhelmed because yep. it's you know in the heights was very impressive as well but like that that was a it's um, a movie yeah, yeah so you you know there was the choreography was amazing and impressive but it doesn't really hit me until I'm watching it live and I'm just like Mm-hmm. what <laughs> there are um there are actually part there's this one part in the heights where they're all like together and it's um i don't want to like say where it is or what's happening because i don't want to like spoil anything in case people haven't seen it but there is a part where they literally had one day it was like the hottest day and it was like they had 60 minutes to shoot and they did that whole seven minute song and dance sequence in that 60 minutes whoa so it was like the big like it was like a crazy shoot and like there if you like know which scene i'm talking about basically everybody sang and there was multiple like every it was just amazing when i read that i was like yeah i can see that this person like you can see the production for like the Broadway production coming through because somebody's doing that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like somebody who's, who knows the knowledge of how it's done. One of my favorite things too, um, I went to see um, Dear Evan, Evan Hansen, which is also a movie <laughs> that's coming out in September. Ooh. Um, but I saw like the Broadway production of it. And that was really cool because there's a big part of it being social media and how they portrayed social media on stage how they showed the screens how they did like the backdrop it was like amazing like some of the way that like somebody's mind works to show this in a stage production versus a movie where like editing can come into play and you can reshoot like it's just um it's amazing and like I said, I'm like, I'm going to gush about this forever. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody stop me. Shall we move on topics? No, no, yeah. I think, we need a mini. <laughs> yes. I think we need a mini episode on this. Yeah. Yes. And a girl's trope. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. You came for our trope discussion and you just got us gushing about Broadway for 20 minutes. <laughs> I mean, there's got to be bookish people who are as obsessed with Broadway and stage productions as they are about books. Come on. True. <laughs> sure yes. If you are a listener and you love Broadway, tell us your favorite show yeah yes. comment on today's thingamabob <laughs> yes well i'm very excited about to talk about oh my gosh i can't even talk today i am very excited to talk about this show <laughs> <laughs> am i gonna edit that out no because we are on stage and we're performing no yeah. i'm just kidding <laughs> um <laughs> Leave it in. <laughs> We're leaving it in. I am I am like not even fixing my speaking abilities anymore because this this is who I am, okay? I can't talk <laughs> to save my life. But anyway, we're talking about a trope that, like I mentioned, is very strange for us. <laughs> um Joanna's gonna start us off, but I'm just gonna mention what it is, and it is faded mates. Um, so yeah, we're Let's just get into it, Joanna. So I just talk about the book, yeah. and then we'll talk about the trope after. Yes, yeah, so let's just start out with the book. Because we, I had lots of thoughts about this. Okay, so <laughs> I read Shifter Island by Leah Stone and Ray Wagner. Which is super popular. It, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. That's why I picked it. <laughs> and I really enjoyed it. It's very fast-paced. It's about um, a girl named Nye. And she is, she's going to be the alpha wolf shifter of her, like, pack. Like, her dad is the alpha now. And she will have to go to what is called, um, oh, I can't remember what it's called. It's like a, it's like a school. It's a school for alphas. Okay. I can't remember what they call it. Um, but her pack have been banished to the mortal world. And there's another world where all of the, like, the shifters are in all of the other packs and the other creatures. Because there's, there's also shifters, um, like, selkies and 
eagles and a bunch of others. Okay. Um, so she's supposed to be going to the school, but she has like a year before she goes to the school and she'll be going to the school for four years. But right beginning of the book, um, she's told that she has to go now. Like she, she's like, I want to say she's 19 and she has to go now. And it's like a shock to everyone. Like, why does she have to go now? And she doesn't even get like a goodbye party or anything. And these four burly huge guys show up to pick her up to take her to this like academy and um they're clearly alphas and there's a lot of banter right at the beginning as they're like driving to this school which is really kind of fun um and so they're like throughout the book you're kind of like trying to figure out how come her pack was like exiled to this world they were also they were um sent to montana and they could only um be within a certain radius so it was almost like they're imprisoned here okay um so they so she goes to this school and um every like pack or whatever they have their own house that's like kind of like a fraternity sorority house and her and her cousin are the only ones there and everyone else has like servants and people that take care of their house and bring them food but theirs doesn't because they're like the shamed she's from the crescent um pack so anyway we learned that the guys that take her to the school are actually from her rival pack and they're very attractive, but, you know, enemies <laughs> can't be attracted <laughs> to them and all this. Um, so at the beginning, there's um, a masquerade party kind of before school starts. Okay. And everyone loves this masquerade party because no one knows who anyone is or what pack they're from. And they can kind of do what they want without having all of those bad feelings of, oh, you're from such and such pack. So they go to the ma this masquerade party and they can also um, like conceal their identity a little bit. Like she turns her hair blue and okay, all of the guys make themselves look the same. So at this party, she ends up kissing this guy and he becomes her like faded mate, like just this instant attraction. But then all of a sudden this thing happens and when there's a faded mate, um, there's like a tattoo that is on their ring finger, kind of like a marriage. Okay. But um, she doesn't know who he is because of the mask. And he basically tells her that he can't tell her who he is. And so throughout the whole book, she's trying to figure out who her faded mate is. And she kind of, she has an idea of who it might be. And she kind of narrows it down. But yeah. It was good. I liked it. <laughs> cool. Lots happened. Yeah. Um, I almost read that book before I found out that Joanna was reading it. <laughs> I picked first. Yes, you did. Because it just, it has me so curious. And I really like both of those authors. Like, I like their, I love their writing style, like their storytelling. So I was like very interested to see, you know, how they took on the Faded Mates thing, which I guess we can talk about that here before we dive into other books, because we have a very, I want to say confused perception of Faded Mates, but I think that every author can interpret it in a different way. Um, and so we also mentioned when we were talking about this before the show that the popular thing now, like Faded Maids used to be a pretty like big thing. Um, but recently it's been like the rejected Faded Mate because people have been missing that angst and not like not being with somebody situation. So yeah, let's just like talk about the... Like the actual yeah, trope. I, I, I feel like the way they got around it is that she didn't know who he was. Okay. And there was this big deal that everyone knew that, that this faded mates thing had happened at this masquerade party, but no one knew who it was. Okay. Because Nye, every morning she had one of her friends like disguise her tattoo on her finger. And it was kind of assumed that the guy was doing the same thing. And so I think that was kind of the way that they got around that because I've never 
really been interested in reading Faded Mates because to me it kind of sounded like it was an instant, this is who you're going to be with, mm-hmm. you don't have a choice in it, and that's it. And I feel like it was kind of missing the, like, getting to know the person. Right, the choice yeah. part. Falling in love with them. Yeah, the choice part, exactly. Yeah, I can understand that. I do play with, I wouldn't say Faded Mates in my books, but I do have the Soul Mates in my books where it's kind of like when you do find that person that, you know, you fall in love with and you like click with, then like your magic is, you know, intensified and multiplied and whatever, because you have found that like your other half, but at the same time, like it's still a choice. Like they have to fall in love first. (laughs) And in the end, like if you don't find that person, like you can still be happy, you know, you can still have that with somebody else. Like, it's not like I have just like one mate for each person, you know, it's whatever, you know, you meet the person and you get to know them and whatever. Um, But I think that's the problem that a lot of readers who don't like faded mates have with it is because that choice seems to be taken Mm -hmm. away and that's probably why we don't write it either because we really like that whole banter and (laughs) will they won't they and all that stuff with our books so um I don't know I just I find this trope very fascinating because I don't write yeah, it. Yeah, same. <laughs> or read it. <laughs> same. I, it is quite interesting as an author because the rules aren't laid down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you can play. Yeah, with, you have to kind of make them up yourself. And and what does it mean to be a fated mate? And how does it work? And can you say no? And if something happens and you don't get together with this person, um, do you ever have another one? No. Right. It, do you have to be? You know. Is it that you're waiting for this one person and then you don't get with anybody else in the meantime? Or is that just a super rare thing that some people may be lucky enough to get, but really you just want to find the best of the people that are around you? Um, there, right. there, there are different ways to play it. Um, yeah, I was thinking about that. Um, one of you, I think, Joanna, you mentioned Twilight, right? Mm-hmm. So that has a... And Breaking Dawn. Yes, yeah. like a faded mates kind of situation, which is very weird to all of us. <laughs> when they're kids, I, there's a, a I think a lot of people thought that was weird. Yeah, I thought a lot of people thought that was kind of weird. Because, because of the way it was written, I think it would have been different if it was like a spin off book and suddenly came into play, you know, yeah. but not. In a sense, it was an it easy did. way to stop the wolf pack killing all the vampires. Oh, no, sorry, you can't yeah, suddenly yeah. do that because fated mates. Woo. <laughs> right yeah um I was kind of thinking about that too a lot of like the older young adult um not in age but like that was published you know before like in t- 2000s or so it had a lot of that insta love um mm-hmm. in it and I feel like that's kind of a play on faded mates because it's like you meet this person and you're suddenly in love because you clicked so that means that like you're destined to be together you know yeah, kind of thing. that kind of is a little really similar to that you're right yeah the only thing that I can really think of where I would forgive that is um like in Greek mythology when you know two characters are like destined to be together because of like their previous lives or something like that and so when they find each other in like their new lives there is an instant connection there because they already have all this history that they don't know about you know um I think that's like the only time that I was ever like really on board with like insta love or faded mates situation um when it was popular basically (laughs) (laughs) But now I also feel it's a lot of it is in like paranormal romance and urban fantasy. Like that's where it stays. Is and a lot of fae. Mates. It's in a lot of fae fae books lately. And, and, and shifters. shifters. Yeah, fae and shifters. Yep. There's lots of that. And the you one can thing get that's re- funny is that. Sorry, Tess, you go. No, you go. <laughs> I was going to say that it can also be in reverse harem books where you have um, multi- oh. multiple connections mm-hmm. to multiple people and then they have to work that oh. out so that the conflict is. <laughs> I don't. I don't understand. Well, yeah, we don't read either. those. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we're doing a trope on that because none of the us read that. Yeah, I've, n- I've like, like, I, I want to give it a shot, but then I'm like, oh, no, yeah. I don't think I will. I don't know. I just, I don't know. <laughs> well, I need, I need definite choices. Yeah, it's hard. When the, oh, yeah, I just don't know if my heart can 
hand. I don't know. I feel like it would stress me out too much. You guys already know how I feel about love triangles when they're like yeah. really intense. <laughs> but then, uh, but even when it's a love triangle, I want them to make a choice, and I want them to make the choice that I want. But I do appreciate. <laughs> I will say that I do appreciate that there are readers who really enjoy the why choose a reverse harem. So I'm really glad that there is. Yes. There are books for that crowd. I just haven't really. I just don't have the desire to read it, but I do want to see the appeal just because I'm curious. But then every time mm-hmm. I get around to like reading one, I'm like, mm, I don't not think I'm good. going to. <laughs> well, and with, but with Reverse Harem, it's not a choice. It's at least the one I read, she was with all Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah, oh, that's yeah. true. No yeah. That's, I think that's it the thing was, is that you have to, she ended you don't up have to choose. It's why, I think that is why what choose? some readers really like. Yeah, they yeah. don't want to, they don't. They don't. They want to see the girl get all the guys. And it's right. it's like yeah, a love triangle, <laughs> but without the angst because they all get chosen. There's no <laughs> angles in it. It's yeah. just a and love circle. <laughs> all the boys are. All the guys are okay. Yeah, with it. yeah. That is a, at least from what I read. They're like, oh, that's cool that you went and slept with him, <laughs> but you're with me now. Yeah. Anyway, I must admit, uh, I, I, I do. I, I, I do bench into the that. corner. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's funny. I'm not surprised, Clary. I just feel like you read everything. <laughs> yeah, so you read a it's lot. Just like you're part such a of, prolific yeah. reader. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Let's let's uh, call back into the faded maids. Faded maids. We're talking about faded maids. <laughs> We're just all over the place in this episode. I love it. Um, Tess, let's talk about your book. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, I wanted to say that like I have yet to read a book about faded mates that clearly defines why it happens and like the reason behind it. It's always just this vague thing that is just accepted. And I think that's why it feels so fuzzy to me and why it never really feels quite rooted is that it's always just like, oh yeah, this is my fated mate. It's because, and a lot of it has to do with like, I think in a lot of the, especially like Faye or Wolf Shifter is that it's deeply entwined into a, like a supernatural culture magic system like it's just Mm -hmm. there and I think a lot of the reason why it's not defined is because that supernatural culture just accepts it so it's never really described but like I'm here but I'm like but why though like how does the (laughs) magic work that makes that happen and so yeah I, I haven't read a book where it's like described like I'm like but would it still happen if you never met would it pick a different person I'm just like having this existential crisis run like how does it work though (laughs) Um, but I have read a few most of the ones I've read are um have been like Faye um and then so I picked one that was Rhapsodic by Laura Talassa and I picked this one because I saw it recommended on like a thread and I'll just say right now that by the end of it I did not feel like the Faded Mates was as strong as I thought it was going to be it wasn't tropey like based on the few Faded Mates books that I have read it didn't feel tropey and it it had like I don't know. It just didn't feel like it was super significant to the plot. So I will say that is I probably didn't pick one that fit Faded Mates as strong as I would think it would. And it also was unconventional in the way. But I'll get to that. I'm probably going (laughs) to spoil that for you guys. So if you don't want to hear about that, like I just can't talk about the Faded Mates part of it without spoiling that part. And honestly, it's not a big deal. Like I wasn't like... I wasn't like shocked and was like, oh my gosh, because some of the Faded Mates stuff, I will say, some of them I've been like, what? Yeah. Wait, what? <laughs> um, and I'm just like sh- so shocked. But this one didn't really have that. So I feel like it's okay if I spoil that. And if it's not okay, I am sorry. <laughs> I'll give you permission. <laughs> okay. They uh, can so blame me. <laughs> I'll just tell you a basic um, synopsis of this or whatever. So this is uh, based on a character. Her name is Calypso. She goes by Callie. She's a siren. Um, the world building was a little unclear to me, but basically like supernatural creatures are like they're out in the open and there's like a specific school they go to. So I don't know. I wasn't really understanding super much how the supernatural world fit in with the human world and it was really just from Callie's perspective so I didn't really get to see how like I don't know that part was was a little confusing but she's a siren um she it starts out with her experiencing a very traumatic experience when she's I think she's like 15 or 16 um something like traumatic happens and she needs help getting out of it and so she calls upon the bargainer um his name is Desmond and he is like he will grant favors and in return you will owe him 
something. And the cost is always like bigger than what, you know, you're just, well, I need it. So I'm willing to do something and he can call on that favor. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it does. It it feels a lot like Faye bargain. Like that world building felt very similar to that. Um, And so his bargains, I think they're usually for most people in the form of tattoos, but he gives her beads on a bracelet. Um, And so that's how it starts. She has this bead on a bracelet that is the favorite. But as she goes on, she calls him back for like more favors and sometimes they're just for comfort because she's like alone and she they start building this friendship this like unconventional friendship um she's 16 and he's immortal so I will say that was a little when I could tell it was starting to get romantic um the 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 world building was that in the supernatural world, if you're 16 or something, some age, you're not a minor anymore. So that was the like okay. excuse part of it. But still, I was like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> like gone are the days of when I read Twilight and I wasn't bothered by a 16 year old girl like being in love with an immortal. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a mom now. And so I'm just I tend to be like. I don't know (laughs) when it comes to those things, but it was, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't like nothing like intense or graphic happened. You could just tell they were falling in love. And that was really sweet to like, uh, watch flashbacks of because it also alternates with her in like regular time. Um, but the bargainer comes back into her life. And so you get to see him coming back into her life and you know that he's left her for seven years. She's super upset. She's really mad. Um, and before they left, they started getting very close and they, you know, she, she kept calling him back for more favors for him to just spend time with her or whatever. And he kept giving her beads, never called in her favor. So you could tell there was something like really sweet and protective going on, whatever. And um, she, he ends, back. she ends up with like hundreds of beads, doesn't she? Yes. Yes. Good point. When, she has when nobody ton. gets more than one yeah and nobody gets to collect them without having their favors called back so he's definitely treating her differently than like his normal clients um so she's an adult now in in the modern day timeline and he comes back into her life and there's something going on where like the um like his people's warriors have been like getting killed um they've been like the females have been coming back in like glass cases with these creepy children and it's super eerie and you're like what is going on (laughs) and he knows that she can help him um like figure out what's going on but then that's also dangerous because the person who's hunting them is like oh i want to collect you too i want to put you in a glass box oh i'm scary and creepy and she's like no that's gross (laughs) um (laughs) 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 and so yeah so that's like the that's the setup of it and it's like like it's really it's very more much more of like a romance plot like the um the mystery of like what's going on is a, more secondary so it was nice to it was a, a fun romance to watch build and you get to start learning about why he left and blah 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 mm-hmm. but so here's where the faded mates part comes in and it doesn't come into like pretty late but basically and I'm probably gonna totally get this wrong because that was it was pretty fuzzy in my brain when I read it but she basically here's the spoiler close your ears if you don't want to hear it she (laughs) like wished them into like being faded mates like what she like she had made it happen magically without realizing it it's kind of hard to explain it was kind of hard to understand so it wasn't that they were faded when they met and that's what I was expecting is that that was why he wanted he was treating her differently but it wasn't exactly that it was different she had done it and so I was like okay that's a different take where she because of something that she did magically it made it happen (laughs) okay I love Volia's (laughs) face right now like you guys can't see it on the video but Volia's face is like what and like, Clary, so I know you read this too, so tell me if you can explain it any better because that's like as good as I can explain the faded me part. I know Valia is going to have a fit, but I read this quite some time ago. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. It wasn't your assignment. Yeah, it was yeah, quite I read it a exactly. long time ago. Um, so I can't remember the details of it. Um, okay, but... so that's all you're getting from me, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I could understand is that she did some magic with her her wishing and the favors and the things and she's the one who made them faded mates and she hadn't really okay. intended that 
Um, so yeah, so I thought that was interesting. It was not tropey at all that, cause I kept looking for the tropes. I'm like, oh, that's why he keeps coming back. And like, that's why he's so mm-hmm. protective because he knows, but she doesn't know yet. And he did find out before she did. So that same, that, I think that's one of the big tropes in a lot of faded mates is one person can tell before the other person. A lot of times I feel like it's the mm-hmm. male is that like the alpha or whatever the male will know he'll have that feeling because it's usually it's I think it's usually whoever's like magical culture it is they can sense that bond whereas like because so many it's so tropey for it to be between like like a fae and a human or a fae and a newly turned fae or like a wolf and like a I don't know it's usually there's one that has a stronger bond to their that magic system and they're the ones who notice it first and the other person doesn't, and that usually creates some tension. So I was kind of expecting that. It was kind of like that, but kind of not. <laughs> but yeah, so those are my thoughts on um, on that book and Faded Mates as a whole. A little, like we've all said, it's a little like ungrounded and confusing, yeah. but it is cool. It's really fascinating. I think it's really cool to see um, the different ways that like authors play with that and how mm-hmm. how the different ways of creating tension with the faded mates trope because with any romance or any story in general it, you have to have some kind of conflict there and it is interesting to see the different ways that conflict I can like happen. it when it happens that way though yeah where it like it it was like her mm-hmm. choice she didn't do it on purpose yeah mm-hmm. but I have seen it happen that way before where it was the couple were already falling in love and by whatever magic whatever happens that they almost chose to be faded mates even though it usually happens like that where it's like they maybe they didn't intend it to happen but anyway (laughs) I do I like it when it happens that way (laughs) I do like the bond aspect of the faded mates like that special connection Mm -hmm. that is a good Uh, point yeah because I just think it just makes it like I wouldn't say like a visual representation of what happens when you're in love, but kind of like a physical manifestation of like how two people can be connected. Um, And I like when you can play with those senses because if somebody is, you know, bonded in a special bond like that, then they can, you know, feel when somebody is in pain or when they're in trouble or something like that. You know, I really like that. I think that's like a really... Um, interesting I don't know thing to add because it just that depth it it adds the depth that I'm looking for in like a romantic Mm -hmm. connection yeah that is a big part of the faded mates trope is like some kind of supernatural bond Mm -hmm. which is like pretty fun to read about yeah Yeah. sometimes you know they have to both accept it and then you know they get a mark or they can you know telepathy or Mm -hmm. something so that they they Mm -hmm. they know that they're there does that segue into your? No, there's none of that book, in this book. Claire, um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't read it, so I was like, "Wait yeah. a minute." <laughs> um, I read "Cord of Silver Flames" by Sarah J. Mass, and actually, it's interesting listening to you, Tess, because of, this is um, Nesta's story. So, for anybody who's read the the previous trilogy, um, "Cord of Thorns and Roses." and whatever the other two are called. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> a court of other stuff. A court of other stuff. <laughs> a court of other stuff. <laughs> this, this is um, Nesta's story. So she's Fair's sister. Um, mm-hmm. And in the other books, there's this whole thing about fated mates and Fair and Risan are, are fated and um, that, that Nesta and Cassian are fated mates, but they are denying it. Um but okay. the rejected well s- sort of <laughs> but it's never actually mentioned in this book that they're fated mates it doesn't come up at all um until like the very end it's like very subtly yeah. like because i was expecting the same thing when i was reading it. i was yeah. like oh because they're you know when i was reading the other books i'm like oh yeah so um what's her name elaine and lucian they're fated mates yeah. and they're also rejecting it i'm like oh and then obviously cassie and anesta like duh that's like I can see what's happening here. And then I was waiting for them to talk about it. I'm like, wait, what? Did I like for, did I read something wrong? And at the very end, it's like, oh yeah. And like, we're accepting this bond that was always there. I'm like, wait, straight up say that you're faded mates because I'm kind of confused. Yeah. 
yeah, this this is Nesta's story. At the beginning of the story, she is incredibly traumatized by everything that's happened in the the previous books, and I'm not going to say what that is in case that's spoilers for anybody who hasn't read those books. <laughs> um, and she is not dealing with it well. She has left everybody. She's living a she's been turned into a fae. I guess I have to say that. Um, so she's had to leave the human world. <laughs> And she's living in the, um, whatever, I can't remember, the the, the Valerian, no, it's not Valerian, is it? The the, the night court city um, where Resand is um, lord. And she has rejected all of them. She doesn't want to be with them. She's got her own flat and she spends all of her time um, drinking and having one night stands, essentially. And 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 (laughs) and sending the bills back to her sister. as she should. <laughs> <laughs> and the story sort of starts when everybody else gets a bit fed up with her and decide that she can't carry on like this and she needs they need to do something about it for her. And they take her away to um, a different house and say, okay, you've got to stay here and you've got to train to fight and you've got to work in the library. And you can't drink. No, oh, more no you alcohol. can't drink. You, and want, you have to go down 10,000 stairs. Yes. Yeah. And back up again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at least she gets her steps in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Working in the library can't be too bad. Uh, yeah, but it's a library for, for, full of... Um, the, the other people who work in the library are all um, abuse victims. You know, they've, they've survived abuse. So they've all got some pretty horrific stories. I, I mentioned last week that I use a tool called Storygraph to review books. And one of the things you can do on Storygraph is you can um, add content warnings, you know, trigger warnings for you know, okay. if there's yeah, a, yeah. things that, that people have. And good. this book gets all of them. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> yeah, it, oh it is incredibly dark. It is incredibly violent. There is lots of stories of abuse. Um, there is um, lo- lots of sex, lots and lots of sex and thinking about sex and smelling sex. And <laughs> it's, it's, it is very <laughs> detailed and graphic. Yeah. Oh goodness gracious! Um, so if if you're at all triggered by anything, don't read this book because yeah, it is <laughs> by anything. No. It's not on my TV. Uh, it, it is oh, an incredibly goodness. engaging story, and Sarah G. Mass is is a very talented writer, and she does hook you. And I read this almost in one sitting, and I cried. What? Oh my god! I, 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 I mean, I was, in, I was in quarantine. I don't have really anything. Well, oh, oh, that's okay. true. I do have other things to do, but um, it was far more um, in interesting than than trying to edit my book because that's hard work, and I didn't <laughs> want to do that, so I read this book instead. Um, <laughs> And yeah, I, I cried at this multiple times. It's incredibly emotional at places. Um, but you know, you you start with this traumatized lady, and you know she's suffering probably from PTSD or something. Although you know, don't mm-hmm. diagnose from the internet. Um, and <laughs> you know, if I was in such a bad place and incredibly depressed and you know struggling with everything. I would not want to have my choices taken away. I would not want to be go and dumped with people that I don't want to be with in a place that I don't want to be and forced to do things that I don't want to do. So in terms of a, a role model for helping other people deal with trauma, it is not a very good model. It is a very good story, <laughs> but it is not what you do if you have a traumatized friend, okay? Um, one thing I did really like about this book is she makes some friends. So there's two other ladies who she makes friends with and they have some really great times and there's some really great interaction between the two of them and, and the, the, the whole girl stuff. Okay. But they're then to show how great they are and how badass they are. They have to go and beat the men at what the men do rather than, Oh yeah. It's like, seriously. Mm. That was not my favorite part of the book. No. Mm -hmm. I thought that was cheesy. I felt I really like I was so excited that they had this opportunity to like so first of all, okay, I'm sorry to jump in on your thing, but this rant has been waiting, okay? <laughs> it's been waiting. Um first of all, this thing that they're forced to do, they didn't really want to do it. They're like plopped there, but it's this like let's just basically call it a race. It's like a race, it's like a danger race. Everyone is it's super dangerous. The like hardened warriors, the um the Illyrians are the only ones who do it, and it's never been okay, correct me if I'm wrong, it's never been won before except for by recent sand and his crew so there are these special snowflakes who are the only ones who's ever actually finished it the specialist snowflakes of all these hardened hardened evil dark warriors 
They're the only ones who've ever done it. And who else is the ones to do it? Nesta's BFFs who have been training for like a couple months, which, okay, I'm all for female empowerment and they should be strong, but I really would have, it would have been more like, it would have been more powerful to me if someone had won it every single year. Yeah. And these are the ones who won it this year. But it's like, oh, no, it's only Rhysand's crew and, like, his his homies and, you know, Nesta's friends. So it just makes it seem like it's just this, these are the only special people are these people in this group. I'm like, I'm all about the women beating them. Like, that was cool. But it just made it seem like, I'm like, it could have yeah. been more powerful if it wasn't, like, it just seemed like it was more, like, not it wasn't believable and mm-hmm. I want it to be and it's not because they're women that I didn't believe it it's because it was set up really cheesy on in my opinion yeah, so no, I, I agree <laughs> there's a rant I've been waiting on because I wanted that to be I wanted that to be to mean more yeah. I wanted it to mean yeah. more when I saw that they were going to compete and I was like oh cool so like only resand the people who know resand are the ones who like win this but all these people have been training it for their, their entire lives they don't win no, nope. nope. they're all they're all eaten by like monsters in the middle of the night because for some reason they're not <laughs> smart enough to tie themselves into a tree like Nesta was. Okay, then now my rant's over. Okay. <laughs> so I've, I was like, all right, Katniss. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> oh, it, it is a bit like Katniss. Yes, it does have. have yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. that's funny. It does. Um, it feels like that a lot. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> um, I have one more thing I want to. S- but see, with with Katniss. Someone always won. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the okay. thing. Is if it would have <laughs> been more like that, yeah. it would have made more sense. But it was like, no, only one group has ever won it. I mean, okay, yeah. so the story behind it is that they, most usually it's always one person out for themselves. So the reason they won is because they all joined, teamed up. I'm like, you can't be telling me that there's never been another time where people were smart enough to make friends with other people to win it together. Like the <laughs> only people who can make friends are Reese, Cassian, and Azriel. Like seriously. Yep. You guys, the rant That's keeps it. going. <laughs> Why is it keep going? For that, I liked that book. Okay, I really liked it, but that was like the one part that really annoyed me. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> okay, I've got. Are you good? I've got one more I thing I want to say about it. Poor Clary. <laughs> I've got one more thing I want to say about it, which is that I was expecting it to be a standalone and to tie everything up, because as as well as what's going on with with Nesta and everything, um. What I probably should have said before was this is dual point of view, so it's half Nestor and half Cassian, which I think is a change from the other books. But Cass- yeah. Cassian is also trying to deal with um, problems with the other queens from other the other human lands, and, and there's a whole other plot going on as well. And that wasn't tied up. So you know, there, there's still <laughs> things going on with that, and I was expecting this to be a standalone book. Whereas it doesn't read like that. It reads like the first in the series because they've still got to deal with all these other things that... Or even a continuation because yeah. it like... I don't feel like that many people... Because I was expecting the same thing that maybe you could jump into this as a spin-off series. But nope, it's really like yeah. book five but with a completely different tone yeah. and a completely different like style. Um, but I do think the next one might be from Elaine's point of view. I don't know I don't if that's know. been confirmed. Uh-huh. I think that's the speculation. I'd be okay with that if they if they start to be a series of of not exactly standalones, but like like companion novels. Yeah, I'd be okay with that because yeah, you're right. It is. There's nothing is really wrapped up. Um, Other than it's like the very them yeah the like to, yeah except uh, be except the mates yeah. that. Yeah, that book is so long though. So Holy long. moly. And it hasn't so wrapped up. <laughs> Does it wrap up anything? Well, it wraps up their the fact that they their relationship, yeah. <laughs> Oh yay! <laughs> oh, and you know, there's some sisterly bonding. That was cute. Yeah. I liked that. The sisterly bonding things yeah. get repaired between Nesta and Farah. Is yeah. that a spoiler? I don't know. I mean, you guys, I do think that this is a different formula. I do think it was more of a romance formula. So I think you can go into it knowing that it's going to have that romance formula where it's like, these yeah. are the people who hate each other at the beginning. Everybody hates each other and it's going to be warm and fuzzy at the end. Uh, the difference is that there is an action plot, which is very secondary and felt not super strong. Mm-hmm. And it is, yeah, it's still open. So that's probably going to carry on to like the next books. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> but as an okay. example, not gonna as read an it, example okay. of fated mates, it didn't mention that at all, apart from like once at the end. So, <laughs> okay. So anyway, I guess we're not talking about fated mates in this episode. But yeah, what are you? We, did. Did right. we talked about. We talked about like what it does and what it I doesn't know. do. 
<laughs> I know, all of our books, but that's the thing. That's like a perfect example of this trope because these and are confused. Yes, <laughs> yes, these books are like all over the place. And what we go into it expecting it to be is not what it is. Yeah. So we're just like, what is happening? Um, yeah, so I read Crown of Fire by Lindsay Hall. And I, I was going to mention this earlier, but I also noticed that all of our books are adult. None of them are young adult. That's true. <laughs> I think is really interesting for the trope because I think before when I did read this trope, it was all young adult. And now it's like nowhere in the young adult and it's all adult. <laughs> That is an interesting observation. I have not really noticed that. And, but now that I think about it, even the ones that I read that I consider to be young adult, they're actually not young adult. They're just, they feel young adult. Like um, uh, Royally Hitched plays with Faded Mates and so does Evermore Academy, at least book one that yeah. I read. Um, and those both, I'm like, oh no, those are young adult. But no, they're, they're older. They're like, they're considered they're upper like- They're YA. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you're right. Yeah. That is interesting um, because I thought this one was going to be a young adult, but that's because I didn't read any of the series that this book is part of. <laughs> so this, um, this book is like a new, book one in a, like a spinoff series or a series that's set in the same world as her previous Faye series. Um, so you meet like these characters before, I believe so. I didn't read the other ones. Um, but yeah, basically I'm going to read like the back of the book because it like summarizes everything really well and why I picked this book. <laughs> um, but it says, my fated mate is a lethal Faye king and I'm going to kill him. Ever since the Court of Flames banished me, I've managed to hide my true nature, chosen one of the fire Faye destined to save us all truth is i'm not that impressive i've spent my banishment hunting demons for fun and slinging drinks at potions and past pastiles pastels i don't know but then the lethally sexy king of court of ice finds me he's been hunting me for years and wants to claim me as his fated mate but it gets darker he plans to sacrifice me to save his dying kingdom one touch changes everything though because i'm the only one who can warm him I'm going to use that to my advantage and convince him to return with me to the court of that banished me years ago. There, I will kill him before he kills me. <laughs> but I'm playing. You like you like my my reading. But I'm playing with fire because I'm not sure if I can resist him long enough to change my fate. And if I don't die, then his entire court will, including him. So yeah, that is basically the setting. Um, you meet the main character like right off the bat. She's hunting a demon, and as she's in this uh bar basically waiting for this demon to make its move or whatever um this super gorgeous man walks in and she's like well he's not a usual clientele of this kind of a shady bar and then she's like oh my gosh he's so handsome and then she goes oh crap the demon's running away so i have to run after him so she like runs after the demon and as she disposes of him and sends him back to hell, she turns around and the super handsome man is there. And he's like, I have come to claim you. And so she's like, ooh, this is a problem. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to describe all my books now. No. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so then they have like a for their first interaction and stuff like that. And she manages to get away um, and go finds her brother. So her parents are dead and she and her brother are like the, when she got banished from her court her brother came with her so i did really like the brother relationship um but anyway that's that's we're talking about faded mates here let me focus <laughs> um so yeah so that's like the whole thing is that um there is a prophecy that says that in order for the ice court to survive the fey the fire fey the chosen fire fae must be sacrificed. And she is the fated mate to this fake king who is the king of the ice court. Um, so I did kind of like the fact that they were enemies, <laughs> <laughs> but they were fated mates. Um, That's a good, like, uh, what's it called? What's the word? Con, not contrast, conflict, conflict. Con yeah, yeah. That's like good... it, it gives you that uh, will they, won't they? Mm. Like right off the bat, because obviously both of them want to kill the other to save their court, but also they have like this undeniable connection that is like 
fated by a magical society, like <laughs> Tess said. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was that was part of the trope in the one that I read too. Okay. Yes. They were they were enemies, but they were fated mates. Yeah. So Ooh. I think that's that's the one I like. <laughs> if that's I had the, to pick that's one, that's the way you like it. How it's done. <laughs> yes. Um. And I did like the fact that um she does have like a physical um. Not a response. The the other thing, effect. <laughs> I was like, what's the other thing? <laughs> the physical effect on him, um, because she is the only one who can warm him. So that's like a thing that changes his character. Because like when you first meet him, he's like this like surly. I don't know, I'm going to murder everybody to save my people kind of thing, which you can understand when you really think about it. Like, it's not <laughs> that, you know, he's bad per se, because he is trying to take care of his kingdom and his people. Um, but then, like, just interaction, interacting with her, he changes as a character and he becomes, I mean, he becomes more mushy than I would have liked. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, I also like my boys to stay strong even when they're being mushy. Um, but, yeah, like, that's that's me summarizing it without any spoilers. Um but the fast, uh, the writing was really good because it was very fast paced, and I think that if I read maybe the previous series uh, where like the world building first happened, I would have enjoyed this book a little bit more, um, just because it is kind of like a spin off or set in the same world, but it doesn't have like a enormous amount of world building, because once again, I think. I, one of you mentioned this. I think it's more focused on the romance versus the the world building and the story. I think Tess, you said that about your yeah. Book. That's how mine felt too. Yeah, and I think with faded romance or faded mates, that's usually the case. Like you're there more for the relationship versus like the rest of it. So the rest of it happens like either because of the relationship or um, like because you know because of where they're at and stuff like that in life. Um, but like the relationship and that whole will they won't they accept their fated bond um, that's like the thing that drives the story which was definitely true with this one because she has a lot of thoughts about killing him but also is like but he's my fated person I don't understand but I want to kill him but I still don't understand <laughs> there was a lot of that um, yeah so I just I find this trope really interesting. <laughs> it is. Well, and I mean, I, I didn't say this when I was talking about the book that I read, but the world building is really good. Oh, and okay. okay. And it's really fun. That's cool. So, and unusual, <laughs> as you can tell by yeah, our discussion. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, I kind of feel like the Faded Mates, like it was there, but it was more trying to figure out what was going on like why she was brought to the school a year early and all of that stuff so okay I really liked the world building so what you're saying is that I need to read Shifter Island, yeah, read <laughs> Shifter Island. <laughs> to get all of it at the same time um well that's a good segue because we do have some recommendations for if this is your thing I would love to hear if this is your thing because like we said this is not a thing we read all the, a lot of this is not something we write um so if you have some recommendations or if you have like a favorite one I would love to hear about it uh, but we have some that we're going to mention uh Clary do you want to talk about the book that you wanted to recommend for Faded Mace yeah. Lovers? I was going to recommend Shifted by Amy Easterling um, Amy Easting has quite a lot of um, Wolf Shifter romance fated mate series books, so they're all quite fun. But um, Shiftless is a good one to start with. Um, it tells a story of Terra. So she is a pack princess. All of the um, girls in who have a high status within the packs are known as pack princesses, and they're really protected by the packs until they um, find or choose their, their mate. And, but she has um, left the pack and she has been living as a human to the point that she is now unable to shift and she has lost connection with her wolf. And her rude, overbearing alpha of a father comes to her and gives her an ultimatum and says, OK, you have to go and find my nephew. So her, I think it's her sister's child. Um, or you have to come back to the pack. So you have to bring the nephew to the pack or you have to come back to the pack. And she then has to um, 
sort that out? And does she want to give her nephew <laughs> back to her father's pack that she ran away with from? Um, so it, it's okay. it's a really interesting story with lots of twists and turns, and um, the it has one of my favourite characters in it, which is called Wolfie, who is um, just very funny and very um, compassionate and down to earth. You know, he's one of those people who really brings out the best in everybody else and he has this pack of misfits and all the people who you know, weren't thought to be good enough to be in the other packs and they've been thrown out or were like um all on their own or for whatever reason and he's then trying to make them be a pack that's taken seriously and really look after the people who um he has in his pack who he cares for so Okay. It's kind of fun. That sounds yeah. nice. I mean, it sounds cool. Yeah. Tess, do you want to talk about your book? Yeah. So it turns out that like every book that I've read that's Faded Mates, either I or someone else has already recommended it on the podcast. <laughs> so I'm just going to recommend one that I've been like interested in that I've had my eye on. And it is it follows that trope we mentioned earlier, which is Rejected Mates. Um, and so it is rejected by Jamie and Eve. And the only other um, book that I've read was she she had co-written another book, The Princess Ballot that I mentioned on here. And it was rather steamy. So I do think I will say that I'm pretty sure this one is probably going to be like super steamy just as an FYI. But um, if you ha- if you've listened to this episode and read any of the books we've mentioned, I can at least say that mine and Clary's were <laughs> quite steamy. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, so I haven't read this one, but like. The cover alone, I'm just like, dang. It's steamy. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, what's going on there? Um, but yeah, I mean, it looks, it, if I was, if I, uh, when I want to explore that rejected faded mates trope, that's like the first one I'm going to read because it looks, it looks interesting. It looks like it's well written and people seem to like it. So yeah, I will say my got a lot of with love. the Amy Easterling books is that hers aren't steamy. Yeah, there, there may oh, okay. be okay. an occasional th- sex scene, but they're all fade to black. Um, and Okay. Most of them don't have. Um, I've read quite a number of her books now, um, and they are a lot lower steam level. I mean, a high level, a lot lower steam level than the Court of Silver Flames. <laughs> <laughs> so Court of Silver Flames is like way at the top, and I know some people are like they're looking for those books. So if that's what you're looking for, yeah. I like mine to be medium hot. I like mine to be like. I like mine to be like a very spicy jalapeno, but like nothing above that. <laughs> I'm okay if there's no nice. seeds in the jalapeno too. So I like mine in the jalapeno range. So, you know, <laughs> somewhere in there. <laughs> okay, then. Just duly noted. <laughs> but like a quart of silver flames is like probably a ghost pepper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm actually going to recommend a book I haven't read either because I just haven't gotten around to it, but it sounds so freaking fun, okay? And once again, I'm going to read the back of the book because, you guys, I'm so bad ex- to explaining books. I'm just going to leave it to the authors. Um, <laughs> but this came out in June, and it's Wolfish by J.K. DeRosa. And first of all, the cover is so gorgeous. I freaking love it. That purple wolf is everything. But anyway... I'm just going to read the back of the book. Fate has a wicked sense of humor. When I was 16, I met the love of my life in magic school. He'd appeared exactly once a year at the annual masquerade ball, then vanish. Fast forward to the present, to the night I'm attacked and my hidden wolf emerges. As it turns out, I'm a freaking hairy-tailed, shape-shifting werewolf. So instead of returning to the human world after graduating, I'm dragged to Moon Valley to control my inner beast. Only problem is I'm not just a wolf and someone wants me dead because of it. When I meet the alpha heir, Sparks Fly, and Bombshell, he's my supposed wolfy fated mate and he's nothing like the boy I loved. He's cold, sullen, a total jerk, but impossibly gorgeous. Mm, Of course. (laughs) And actually, of course, it's in the description. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I love that. Um, And he's got secrets too. Despite hating him most days, I can't deny the irresistible attraction and neither can he, even after he rejects me. Little does he know, I'm more than capable of taking care of myself, maybe even capable of taking his claim as alpha. Ooh, that sounds good. Right? I like saw that and I was like, all right, okay, just Amazon, you got the recommendation correct because that actually sounds like right up my alley. Um, Yeah, I'm going to add that to my like rejected wolf mates tbr because that one sounds awesome 
I really think like they've really played the enemies to lovers trope in this mm. too, which we know we love. Yep. Um, yeah. Um. <laughs> so I'm like excited, but it's really funny because the little blurb at the end it says, "If you love." Leah Stone's Wolf Girl, Lindsay Hall's The Darkest Moon, and Jamin Eve's Rejected. Start reading this now. <laughs> okay, so we know, like, yeah, this is in, this is in the the crowd of the yes, yeah, <laughs> the Faded Mate books. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, I mean, that was I had so much fun with that because I love these tropes that we know nothing about. <laughs> yeah, that was a really interesting conversation. I did not realize until we started this reading thing. <laughs> how like confusing faded mates were i really did not realize that i was confused about it until i realized i was confused about it <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> Um, but yeah, if you ever want to pick up any of the books we're discussing, we do have a link to a bookshop page and also an Amazon uh, book club. So Amazon book club will have like the Kindle books and the bookshop page will have all the hardback and paperback on there. Um, I'll leave the link to the shop and our website in the show notes and also the description. So you guys can just click on that if you want to check out any of these books. Um, next week, Tess will be back. Ooh. And then Kay and Hannah will also be joining us. Uh, but before we say see you later to these ladies, I'd love to know what everyone is reading this week. So Joanna, what's on your TBR? I'm beta reading an epic fantasy. F- Ooh. Fun. Mm. It's called The Shadow Wheel. Ooh. Nice. Cool. Tess, what about you? Um, I taking a break from queen of shadows just because i do that now midway through um and i actually already finished my book but i'll mention it it is verity by colleen hoover um so like okay thriller ish i mean it's definitely mm-hmm. thriller there's some romance in there and like there's a pretty good twist i had to like talk my husband's ear off this morning about it because i just finished it last night and i was like <laughs> laying in bed and i was like okay yeah <laughs> i gotta talk to someone about this <laughs> I love that. Clary, what about you? I'm reading The Lightning Thief, the first Percy Jordan um, book by Ooh. Rick Riordan. And I'm reading it in Dutch, just to be difficult. Oh, nice. <laughs> oh. <laughs> We're like, That's a good series. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't read it. I got it out of the library because I thought my son might be interested in it, but he didn't. So I'm like, right, fine, I'm taking it. I'm reading it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I felt like it really got good at book okay. three. Oh, I didn't make I mean, it that far. I the first far. two are good. The first two are good, but I really got hooked. Okay. Oh, well, I'm looking forward to that then. Yeah, I just started it the other day, so I'm I'm a little bit in. It's exciting. I did not read as a ch- that as a child, and I only made it to, I think, to book three, actually, as an adult. I just, I don't read middle grade. You guys know this, so. <laughs> as an adult, too. Oh, did you really? But Yeah, I did. Yeah, which is fine. It's good. I mean, I liked it. I just didn't have like an attachment to it like some people do. Well, I haven't so. read it at all. So I'm like the <gasps> only person on this podcast today who hasn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't read and it yet. Won't. I'm just starting it. Um, yeah, she's and just I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, it wasn't out when I was a child. I couldn't have read it then. Um. <laughs> oh, yeah, it wasn't out when I was a child either. <laughs> well, I don't know. I just feel like I miss out on all those stuff because by the time I made it to America, like – Everybody has read like Harry Potter and Percy Jackson and have you read whatever. Harry Potter? No, <laughs> I read the first four books. I didn't know that. No, I read the first four books like oh, okay. literally a couple years ago. Like finally okay. got around to it, <laughs> and I stopped anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> the book I will be reading. I have watched all the movies though, and I do in love like like the world and all that stuff. But I just haven't gotten around to finish the books. Um, I will be reading The Maidens by Alex, um, uh, Michael, oh, Michael, I, Michael, Le- Michael Lewis, Michael, I can't wait like to that. hear if you like that one because that <laughs> one's on my TBR too, because you know, I have to have my thrillers mm-hmm. like on, cause that's my, that's my break type reading is like, I have to have yep. a stack of thrillers to snatch up when I need my, to get on my reading slump. Yep. Ooh, I'm excited I for you am to read that. so excited. I love The Silent Patient. That and one was really good. I am very curious to see how this book plays out because with like the silent patient, everybody was like, there's a twist, there's a twist. And so 
I guessed the twist really early. <laughs> oh, no, you did. <laughs> but then in this book, I haven't heard anybody talk about it. And I'm like literally ignoring everything anybody <laughs> says about it just so that I can be like, if there's a twist, which there probably will be, I don't want to like know about it. So maybe a book will finally surprise me. Like I'm like waiting <laughs> for that to happen. So I'm like in a little bubble, not like reading anything about this book. Anyway, good idea. Yes, that's we'll see we'll see how it works <laughs> but yeah thanks so much for listening to the reading queens uh before you go please take a moment to leave us a review and follow us on your favorite podcast platform and then stay tuned for next week happy reading bye, bye. bye.